Greetings YouTubers, my name is PhD Tony and I owe you all an apology. I was intending to have a video out last week that was discussing gas pressure and how flat earthers get it so terribly wrong. But in the process of researching for that video, I came across the following catastrophically stupid declarations by a prominent flat earther. Kudos Thunderfoot Clown with his gas bouncy balls! Let's have all have a damn good laugh at Thunderfoot Clown! Here comes Thunderfoot Clown! Bouncy balls aren't gas clown! But this religious zealot with his 105 year out of date rhetoric seems to think that actually gas is represented by solid. Something that a seven-year-old understands better than. So, Thunderfoot's an abject clown. And a couple of them have said, yeah, yeah, I know I was ridiculing you, but the gas fancy balls example was pretty poor. I'm like, yeah, no shit. I have never listened to a Flat Earth channel. I never have, and I never will. The only way I encounter Flat Earth the content is when it is sampled on a debunking channel. But even as a newcomer to the community... I can't help but notice the marked propensity for Flat Earthers to congregate in small gaggles, giggle at one another's jokes, and reassure one another that they are intelligent, relevant, and worthwhile. They are, of course, none of these things, and I am generally content to let them rot in obscurity. But in this particular instance, I think that a direct response to Mr. Oakley's demented ramblings is warranted. What staggers me most about these utterances is the transparent, sneering contempt Mr. Oakley clearly has for his audience. So convinced is he that his audience will swallow any putrid, vacuous gibberish he may vomit that he doesn't even bother to make it even vaguely rational. But since his subscriber count remains non-zero, it is obviously necessary that I begin my education program at a somewhat more fundamental level than I was originally anticipating. So today's presentation is going to focus on the molecular theory of matter, the various states that matter can assume, and the kinetic model of molecular motion in gases. In its classical non-degenerate form, matter is composed of extremely small discrete units known as atoms. Atoms and their associated ions are the smallest physical units that preserve the chemical properties of the elements of the periodic table. I don't intend to delve into too much detail on subatomic structure. Atoms have a nucleus consisting of protons and neutrons surrounded by a cloud of electrons. Each element on the periodic table is uniquely identified by the number of protons contained in the nuclei of its atoms. Multiple atoms of one or more elements may combine with one another via a number of electron bonding processes to create larger structures called molecules. Some molecules are extremely reactive, and when mixed with the right reactants will release a significant amount of energy. Other molecules are very stable, and will remain in their initial configuration unless a large amount of energy is dedicated to breaking apart the bonds that hold them together. Earth's atmosphere consists primarily of two reasonably stable gas species, molecular nitrogen and molecular oxygen. In observed reality, we note that at low temperatures, water assumes a solid configuration which we call ice. As ice is warmed, it transitions into its more familiar liquid phase, and as it is warmed further still, it transitions into water vapour, a gas. The same transitions from solid to liquid to gas are observed in a broad variety of materials. These three phases constitute what are known as the classical states of matter. More exotic states of matter do exist, such as plasmas and Bose-Einstein condensates, but we will not discuss these materials here. The different physical properties exhibited by the three classical states of matter are best understood from the perspective of molecular structure. For instance, solids are distinguished by a highly ordered molecular structure in which neighbouring molecules remain adjacent until sufficient energy is received that the intermolecular bonds are broken and the material transitions to a liquid or a gaseous phase. By contrast, gases are distinguished by the fact that their component molecules have velocities and positions that are completely independent of one another. This independence of motion is so complete that individual gas molecules can spontaneously move from regions of high concentration into regions of low concentration via a process called diffusion, much beloved and misunderstood by flat earthers. We will discuss this process in more detail later in this presentation. 
Liquids represent a transitional phase between solids and gases, and have properties of both. Like solids, liquids have a well-defined material limit, are relatively incompressible, and at any given temperature have a relatively fixed volume. In common with gases, liquids have no ability to sustain or resist shear forces applied to them. On encountering any such force, gases and liquids reconfigure their geometry to adopt a minimum energy configuration. This shared physical characteristic qualifies both gases and liquids as what physicists call fluids, that is, materials whose macroscopic motions are well described by fluid mechanics. We move now from a general discussion of states of matter to the particular case of a gas near Earth's surface, in particular Earth's atmosphere. Advanced observational techniques allow us to determine the effective radius of both nitrogen molecules and oxygen molecules. We can also experimentally determine the volume occupied by one mole of gas at standard temperature and pressure. These quantities may be combined via a series of simple mathematical manipulations shown here, which I shall not discuss in any detail. The end result is a demonstration that less than 0.1% of the air we breathe is actually comprised of molecules. The rest is empty space. To perform these calculations, I have relied on the definition of a mole and the associated concept of Avogadro's number. If you are not familiar with either of these terms, you are going to have to Google them yourself. Reorganization of these formula and use of the same observationally derived terms allows us to determine the ratio between mean intermolecular distance and effective kinetic diameter for Earth's near surface atmosphere. We thus obtain the result that for a nitrogen and oxygen atmosphere, under pressure and temperature conditions that apply near Earth's surface, the ratio between the mean intermolecular distance and the effective kinetic diameter is approximately 12. All of which is just a long-winded way of saying that even at the relatively high pressures that apply near Earth's surface, individual gas molecules are actually relatively isolated. This isolation only becomes more profound at higher altitudes where pressures rapidly decrease. Because the distance between the individual molecules in Earth's atmosphere is large relative to the size of the molecule itself, the motions of these molecules are independent. The path followed by any individual molecule is a function of the initial conditions, its original velocity and position, and the forces that are applied to it as it travels, be they gravitational, electromagnetic, or the result of intermolecular collisions. The average velocity of the component molecules of a gas are a function of the temperature of that gas, but not all of the component molecules will have the average velocity. There will be a distribution of velocities, some faster, some slower. The character of the velocity distribution may be determined from statistical mechanics and is given in the top panel of this slide as the Boltzmann distribution. As an individual gas molecule moves along its course, it will suffer random intermittent collisions with its brethren. Intermolecular collisions, whether between gas molecules or gas molecules on a surface, are always elastic. That is to say, the kinetic energy of the system is the same after the collision as it was before. We reach this conclusion based on real-world experience. We observe that gas pressure in closed systems does not fall rapidly. This can only be the case if all intermolecular collisions are effectively elastic. These collisions will cause chaotic changes in the direction and speed of the molecule's travel, resulting in what is called a random walk. This schematic diagram shows the results for three separate simulations of a random walk for a particle originating from the same position. Random walks undertaken by component molecules are what allow gases to spontaneously diffuse and change volume. However, all trajectories taken by individual molecules, which is to say all random walks, must obey conservation of energy and must conform to the forces applied to the system as a whole. Diffusion is not a source of energy and will not grant a molecule in Earth's atmosphere enough energy to escape Earth's gravitational well. So where does that leave us? We have demonstrated that the intermolecular collisions that gas molecules experience are completely elastic. We have demonstrated that gas molecules move subject to conservation of energy and subject to the forces that are applied to them. 
We have also demonstrated that the motion of an individual component gas molecule is independent of that of the other component gas molecules, except insofar as intermolecular collisions are concerned. All of which demonstrates that Thunderfoot's metaphor that individual gas molecules behave very much like very small elastic spheres is entirely accurate. Further, the fact that he is discussing the motion of individual molecules and not molecules in a solid lattice precludes the interpretation that he is somehow suggesting that gases are solids. Or to put it more succinctly, Thunderfoot tried to educate Mr. Oakley and Mr. Oakley responded by spewing loud, ill-tempered nonsense. Yeah, we're going to be needing a retraction. No, Mr. Oakley, what you need is therapy and remedial training in ethics and morality. We're going to need that retraction because if you don't give it, we're going to continue to call you a fraud. Because we all know that there's no fate worse than being called a fraud by a flat earther. Okay, so I think that will bring this episode to a close. I do apologise for the digression into remedial 8th grade physics, but with the preliminaries out of the way, we can move on to gas pressure, gravity, and how flat earthers completely screw them up in the next episode. Until then, thank you for watching.